Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, December 5th, 2006. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott, and we're privileged to have with us today Cyril Wolf. Welcome, Cyril. Thank you. How are you? Feeling fine, thank you. Good. I'm going to ask you a few questions about your background and then we'll talk about your service experiences. Right. Um, when and where were you born? I was born on August 20, 1912. 1912, and where? In a large town named Queenstown. In the southern province of South Africa, known as the Cape Province. And currently, where are you living? Beg your pardon? What town are you living in now? Oh, I now live in Brookline, Massachusetts. How long have you lived in the States? Uh, I arrived in America on the 1st of August. 1991 as an immigrant. What made you decide to come over here? Uh, I had my three children living here already. And that was my other question. What is your marital status? Uh, I am a widowed. And you have three children? Three children, two daughters and a son, who is the youngest. And my eldest daughter lives in Brookline. Okay. And you live with her? And uh, no, uh, we live about three quarters of a mile apart. I live in a large apartment building, and uh, ninety percent occupied by seniors in Brookline. Where and when did you enter the military? Um, I was living in a town named Robertson in South Africa. Had been living there for 10 years. And when war broke out in 39, I started winding down the business I was in. And, and what business was that? Um, electrical service installation and also a cycle shop. And how old were you at that time? Um, at the time of my, when the war broke out, I was uh, about 27, 28. And did you enlist or were you activated? Uh, no, it was uh, in, enlisted. Were you considered an older gentleman for enlisting at that time? Um, well, it was rather mixed. It was mainly the uh, young men with uh, English connections, English descent, my parents both came from London to South Africa. And uh, what brought it, them to South Africa? Um, my father had an uncle who was already living in South Africa about 10, 15 years. And uh, my dad must have been in touch with him and um, told him of the opportunities in a country where there were not too many white people at the time and uh, he emigrated in 1902 mm -hmm. and my mother followed him they were engaged and they became married the day my mom arrived by um, by a boat or liner from Southampton, England. So you were born in South Africa? And I was born in South Africa. Mm -hmm. What branch did you join when you enlisted? 
Well, you one didn't join a branch, actually. Uh, you all went into the melting pot to learn to which was your left foot and which was your right foot and to become a soldier. And after the, I would say, four to six months preliminary training, then we were classified into different sections depending on one's background. And where did you have your training? Um, early training, we had traveled by train from Cape Town, which was the large city in, in the southern province, or the Cape province, to Johannesburg. Uh, the name of the training camp was Roberts Heights. And you said you had four to six months training. What do you remember about that? Uh, <laughs> a lot of squad drilling and we we learned to handle a rifle. We went to a rifle range and practiced our sh shooting skills. And once you were done, you said they would then put you in a particular area. Uh, yes. And, we, and what was your specialty at that well point? Well, being in the electrical um, service business before the war, uh, I was graded as an uh, uh, electrician, Air Force electrician. Now when you say Air Force, is this the British Air Force? Uh, no, this was the South African Air Force. That's seconded to the uh, British command. And how was it determined um, once you were classified, what type of training you would receive? Well, we went on to aircraft electrical training, what we would be, be expected to do. Um, the, some of the aircraft was early British, uh, but it was mainly American aircraft. Did you find that you eased into the position with your background, or did you have to have a lot of training? Um, no, it was just a matter of adjustment. Uh, it was the same ideas and principles in electricity, but a lot more uh, sophisticated equipment that we'd not seen before. And once you started and uh, completed this training, what was your first duty station? Um, I was moved to a uh, flying school where pupils, pupil pilots were being trained. And we were working on the aircraft of the, the pupil pilots used. So they were practicing their skills and you had to make that, sure that the aircraft was in good shape? Well, uh, my, my section was electrical. They were the, the mechanics who looked after the engines and other mechanics who looked after the landing equipment. There were the radio guys who kept the radios going. They were in constant contact they, when they started training, it was a twin-seater. Uh, the pilot sat at the, behind the uh, pupil and they were radio connection to each other. And then later on, when they went solo uh, flying, they were still in radio connection all, uh, all the time. And uh, a, a big part of the training of the work was uh, keeping the batteries well, <coughs> well uh, charged and always uh, fresh batteries at hand. 
Now, were you there with a group of electricians, with a unit, or were you sent there as an individual because of your specialty? Uh, no, we were first a group of electricians, mm -hmm. and then later on we were assigned to uh, a section of so many planes. Did you make long-lasting friends with, with other electricians that were in the Air Force oh, with yes. you? Oh, yes. And some friends I knew from South Africa from the early days, uh, we met up again, didn't necessarily um, join up together. So was that a surprise when you would run into a, a, an old friend yes, or an acquaintance? Yes, oh yes, it was a big surprise. And then from that training school, I went to another training school back to Cape Town. Uh, the uh, area was known as Newlands. And they had a training school there. Um, I'm not sure if it was the same aircraft, uh, but uh, the work was the same. And uh, the, the battery, in fact, I was in charge of a battery charging shop as well. Um, that was quite a quite a big uh, big outfit. So, when you were in charge of this, how many individuals worked with you? Uh, there were two to three other in the in the in the battery shop. Were you in any type of direct combat? during this time period or after this time period? No, but this was all um, took part in South Africa, mm -hmm. preparing while we had the skills to help with the training of the, of the uh, younger pilots. And uh, later on, after about um, almost two, no, it was a, just 18 months, I uh, was shipped to uh, North Africa, to Egypt, that was our, our destination. And about what year was that, Mr. Wolf? Um, I enlisted on the 1st of July 1940, and this would be towards the end of 41. So 1941, and your ship to Egypt. What do you remember most about Egypt itself, having come from another part of the world? Well, we almost immediately were transported to our base camp, uh, where we would be living. And where was that? Um, it was a, a part of Egypt that we just knew it as LG, I think it was LG 99 that meant landing ground. And there was a, a, um, a runway um, uh, made out of the of the uh, level area of land, the bush and all that had been cleared, and there was a, it was earthenware runway, no, uh, no tarmac or anything, no buildings. We had our uh, electrical uh, caravans that we got our equipment and so forth, otherwise we it was uh, awnings put up close to our charging plant, which we had to have to charge the batteries there as again. So when you mentioned awnings, was it more like a tent city? A yes, definitely area? a tent city. Was it hot? Well, it was hot, and in, surprisingly enough, in winter was very, very cold. It was clear skies, but we were very well 
equipped with warm winter battle dress. And how long were you there for? Be hard to say, I would say um, that would be the beginning of 42. Um, we were there about six months. Mm -hmm. During that time, were the aircrafts that you were working on in battle? Um, yes, uh, we were, our squadron, the squadron I was posted to was number two fighter squadron. And we were flying American fighters named Kitty Hawk. And uh, each squadron had uh, three flights of eight planes each. And our planes were used mainly as top cover to bombers. Do you remember any particular situations that struck you about some of these planes, some of the individuals that were um, obviously risking their lives? Are you referring to the pilots? Mm -hmm. Well, they were young men, mainly South Africans, and um, as officers, they all were from lieutenant upwards. A uh, young uh, gentleman uh, in the early 20s. And we didn't have much social contact with them. It was only when they, we were alerted when they were to fly out and we'd be there, warm up the planes. That would be the engine fitters. And each one had to do his electrical check over the planes <clears throat> to see that they were 100%. And as the plane landed, that was priority. Get it serviceable immediately, ready for <clears throat> takeoff again if needed. When you mention um, being in this base camp and it being warm in the warmer months and very cold. Do you feel that your clothing was adequate, what they supplied for oh, you? Oh, yes, definitely. The, the, the winter battle dress was excellent. What was it? What, uh, what did it include? Uh, well, you had a, like a bunny jacket and slacks, but of a very heavy woolen, greenish, khaki color. It also looked very smart to go out. And uh, a big advantage, Cairo was only about, I'm not sure, between 30 and 40 miles away. And when we had leave, usually weekend, we could uh, hitchhike into Cairo. And what do you remember about Cairo? Was it an active city? Oh yes, it was very active. French was, French language was used uh, often. Uh, it was very <coughs> modern. Certain areas were <coughs> out of bounds to the, to the troops, but it was good to get in and we were amply, uh, um, I can't say supply, but there was ample accommodation with YMCA's and other organizations that which catered for soldiers coming in on leave. Do you remember any stories about your trips into Cairo? Everybody um, behaved or any kind of funny stories? Well, the YMCA's and soldiers clubs uh, were very popular for meals and uh, soldiers could were, had the opportunity and the facility to write home and do shopping and buy souvenirs 
and then also um, from Cairo a trains ran I think every day to Jerusalem which was an overnight journey and that was another source of touring and seeing other parts of the of the country uh, where we were in Egypt at our camp LG 99 we were can only guess about 25 miles away from the Great Pyramids. We all used the opportunity to see the Sphinx and Pyramids and we all had pictures taken of ourselves sitting on a camel with the Pyramids and Sphinx sort of in the background. It was just these camels were there for, at the disposal of the photographer who had them as a part of a, you paid obviously, you paid I think three or four dollars for the right to sit on a camel and which was lying down and you got on the, to the camel, the dromedary with the one hump and he struggled up with you hanging on and uh, had your photograph taken. We usually two at a time and uh, each had a camel. That was a big attraction to send that picture home, which I have copies of today. And did, did you stay at this base camp throughout your time in the war or were you change where you moved to another area. No, uh, uh, came a time, I think it was in October, when the big push against the Germans and Italians started, we had to wait for the uh, rainy season to, to uh, subside and we could travel and uh, on the there was a tarmac roadway right across from Egypt right across Africa almost within sight of the Mediterranean uh, it ran through three or four countries before it got to Tunis and that took a, a couple of months to get there while you were traveling across Egypt towards Tunis, did you meet up with any of the enemy or were you fairly safe? And now we being the Air Force, we were always behind the infantry and tanks and uh, um, small cannon that was used. And did you see or hear that they were protecting you and therefore they ran into some enemy fire? Oh yes, uh, they were front line. Did you ever fear for your safety? Um, only once or twice when we went up to the front line individually to go and see old, old friends who were in the infantry. But fortunately when we when I was visiting, in one case I stayed overnight, um, there was no problem. Now when you say October, the push against the Germans, October of what year was that, 19? Uh, let's see, um, it would be 41, 42. 1942. So once you arrived in Tunis, did you set up camp again? Uh, yes, we had a ten town area allocated to us. Very nice area, trees. Um, by the time we set up camp in Tunis, the war in Africa was over. The Germans had retreated through Sicily to Italy and uh, they were closely followed by the British and American forces. And um, 
I transferred from the fighter squadron when the war in Af Africa was over. Um, the South Africans had a photo reconnaissance squadron. Um, I think it was 40, 40 um, squadron flying with British Mosquito aircraft. Um, uh, it was almost a, a, a spy plane taking photographs of enemy territory. So you were in charge again of overseeing the electrical... I was, I was <laughs> still doing my electrical work, a bit varied. <clears throat> but uh, before telling you about that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the journey up from Egypt to Tunis. Yes. We went through the country, I think it, a country called Saranaika. It was occupied by Italian troops and they of course had all retreated, left a lot of their things behind as the Germans did, left one squadron of theirs, of their fighters, was stuck in the mud. They had picked a nice hollow to park their fighter aircraft, but they didn't uh, think of the, of the rains coming and the hollow, their fighters got stuck in the mud up to the old, almost the wheels were vanished in the mud. Um, we went through the uh, country named Tripolitania, of which Tripoli was the capital. Mm -hmm. And in going through Tripoli, I was amazed to see we were in convoy, our driver wouldn't stop to us to take pictures, but there was a column of marble about 25, 30 feet high, about four feet in diameter, and on the top of this column was a large slab of marble, um, I'd say twice the size of a normal house door. And on top of the marble slab was a bronze of a she-wolf standing up about, I'd say, three, four times life size. And underneath the wolf, sitting on the ground, were two infants in diapers, of which one was suckling from the wolf, the she-wolf. And that was Romulus and Remus. I'm not sure if it's a fable or fact, but um, I know Rome was named after Romulus, so it goes back many years. And could you, you couldn't take pictures, you didn't have Unfortunately, the time? Unfortunately, uh, we were in convoy moving and we, our driver wouldn't, we yelled to him to stop it. But uh, I think there are pictures of those in various parts of the world, that type of, but that was a bit historical. And then we went through the malaria area, <coughs> fairly close to Tunis. And there I saw the biggest signboard in my life. It was painted a dark green colour. It was back off the tarmac road that we were travelling on. And um, I, it, all I can say, it was huge. And the lettering was a bright yellow painted on this dark green background. And the message was very terse. Take map green or die. 
and Bep Green was the uh, little tablet, the MDL, our squadron doctor, made sure everyone was taking this anti-malaria uh, tablet. But this notice was so impressive, you took your mepicrine all right. And it stuck with you all these years that you remembered even the color. Yes, oh gosh, that was, that was something. <clears throat> so then, once you got through Tripoli, into Tripoli, um, you mentioned the, the squadron that was flying British mosquito planes, and you, you referred to them as possible... Oh, that was in Tunis. Oh, I'm sorry, in Tunis. That was in Tunis. We transferred to a photographic squadron using American cameras named Fairchild, three cameras, two at an oblique angle sideways, and one down. The photographer lay on his tummy looking through his little window. He had a green button and a red button to guide the pilot left or right to get over the part he was photographing. And um, these were British planes, these mosquitoes, um, South African pilots. But the part they were <coughs> photographic when I w was with them before we moved to Italy was the Pluesti oil fields <coughs> of Romania and that was a, a source of oil supply for Hitler's uh, war machine and from the pictures that we took, this is quite an amazing story, the American unit of ladies, I think based in London, where the pictures must have been flown to, they made <coughs> a model of the terrain showing the the approach to these area where the Ploesti oil fields were at the base of a slope of hills and mountains and um, they built a model I, I believe I never saw the model it, I believe it was about eight foot by eight foot and they photographed the model and this photograph of the model was shown to the pilots who went to do the, the bombing and they were, uh, they flew from England to do the bombing and they bombed those oil fields out of existence. So everybody played a part in this. Oh, you mentioned was. the US women. Do you know, were they waves or wax? I, they must have been, to me, specialists for, from a flat photograph. Maybe these American Fairchild cameras were also amazing at taking at an angle. They got the idea of elevation. The big thing is the pilots looked on the, what they were going to bomb, they looked as if they'd been there before. It was so well done. It was so clear to them based on the yes. models that they could... And they bombed these oil fields quite, quite, they just flattened all the structure that was there. So when you mentioned these cameras and these planes, what role did you play in all of this? Keeping, again, all of the electrical equipment that is in correct. order? That did is you ever go up in the planes with any? I other? had to go once with the... They had a fault with one of the mosquito planes that uh, the wheels were coming down. And sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't. And they'd fly around and they'd, they'd go 
fly a bit high and then they'd dive and turn up sharp and then the wheels would maybe come out. And uh, I knew what was controlling these uh, a relay, an electrical relay, and uh, I wanted to see what this relay was doing in the air. And luckily it was situated just behind where the pilot sat. And uh, well, we were up about 20 seconds when he was attracting the, the wheels, I saw where the fault was. So I told him, sir, you could land. He says, what, I'm not up yet, sort of thing. I said, well, I've, I've seen where the fault is. And we just changed that relay, which we did. And uh, that's the only time I was up in the Mosquito. That was a British plane, twin engine, uh, Rolls-Royce uh, engines. And another from Tunis, while they, <coughs> excuse me, while they were photographing the Pluesti oil fields, one of our mosquitoes returning to our to Tunis had to make a forced landing on the island of Corsica, and uh, it turned out well. We flew over. We had an old converted. Maryland bomber, which um, was for the purpose of transporting the mechanics if they had to go anywhere especially, because when the plane landed in, in trouble, you had to take the electricians and the engine fitters and the riggers and the um, I think they, they, they were also, these planes had uh, two machine guns, so there were about four or five mechanics went. And um, it happened to be engines and electrician and radio man. We had nothing to do, so we walked around the town. And we came across a, a very ordinary, smallish house with a very unique a monument outside the house and it, it was a, a monument of four men standing at four corners of a, of a slab of marble only about seven, eight foot high resting on the shoulders of the four men and on top of this slab was a bronze horse with Napoleon sitting on the horse. And the little house it was in front of was the house Napoleon was born in. That's very, and, very historic, isn't it? Um, there was a little French-speaking caretaker there and there was, you could go in and a small house, we looked around, we, all the rooms you could just stand at the door and look, there was a little area roped off. And at one bedroom, the little French caretaker conveyed to us, I'd learnt a few words in French by then, from being in Cairo and talking and in shops, and he indicated and he, his few words he said, and he patted the foot of the bed for two English pounds. He'd allow us to sit on the corner of the bed Napoleon was born in. And I thought it was two pounds well spent, and so was the radio man with me. He had the same idea, and uh, that was quite one of the highlights. And incidentally, the four men who were holding the slab of marble on their shoulders, that must have been a very strongly built, because this marble and the Napoleon on a horse with his, sitting in his Napoleonic 
uh, method or how we always sat with his hand in his tunic. Um, anyhow, these four men were, Napoleon made each brother of his, and these were his four brothers, he made them a king. But he was a king only of a, of a, of a town or, or small sure. Getting area. back to your service years, how long were you in the um, Air Force? Uh, we were in the Tuminous area, um, I would say about two and a half to three months. But one highlight I must tell you uh, about the Tuminous area, our, resident, our tent town where we stayed was about 20 minute drive from the Tuminous airport. And I was driving a truck with two other mechanics along the road and all of a sudden out of the blue comes an American motorbike and an officer on it and it says, pull up off the road and wait there. I didn't know what, how, what was happening, which I did. And then I heard more motorbikes coming and we looked and here comes a, a riding abreast on the road, I think five or six motorbikes, about five, six yards behind the motorbikes was a black limousine, and behind the limousine was another five motorbikes riding abreast, not going very fast, and as it got nearer, the three of us saw President Roosevelt sitting in the back of this limousine. We, of course, shouted uh, whatever sort of greeting, threw our caps in the air, and uh, he didn't look at us, he just raised his hand, like acknowledged we were there. And then this our little entourage went past and no one told us we could go or no one came back and said you're free to go so no there was no one so we just continued to to our camp to the uh, to the uh, Tunis airfield. So you saw the monuments to Egypt, you saw Napoleon and you saw President Roosevelt. That's right. And then when you were finishing up your career. Were you back in South Africa? Yes, we moved from Tunis to Italy and set up camp and uh, we only, I was only in that camp about 10 days when I, uh, I had a replacement, some other electrician. I never knew he was coming. It was um, we were, I, I'm not sure if it was our Christmas dinner or which we may have had a, a week late on account of movements. Um, while I'm having Christmas lunch here comes a voice shouting my name and looking for me who I happen to know from South Africa and I left the next day back, flew home down back to Johannesburg South African uh, transport flew just by day and it took about five days to get out in Africa. Saw a lot of wildlife from the air and I got back to Africa in 1944, the beginning of 44. And were you discharged at that point? Uh, not yet, oh no, I uh, went on leave and uh, I was still sent up to another um, squadron where um, we were doing uh, the fighters uh, cover for 
for um, for bombers. They were bombers looking for for submarines. This was off the coast of of uh, of South Africa, the north east coast. And how long were you there? I was there uh, until. Well, the war was just about over and I applied to go back to Cape Town. I wanted to attend college and further my electrical studies, improve on, pick up anything more modern and up to date. And uh, they gave me a transfer back to Cape Town where I could still be doing um, more or less just guard work at at this um, at a at an a, another air uh, another base a general all all troops are coming there to be demobbed and we had to wait our turn and uh, so waiting your turn and you wanted to apply to college did you apply to college and uh, yes I attended uh, now like the United States in the GI Bill did you get any kind of help from your government to um, for tuition reimbursement uh, no, they, well, you can say we weren't charged any, if you were in uniform, you weren't charged a, a fee. You weren't charged a no. fee? Okay, so you got free tuition. That's right. And how long did you go on to college for? Um, that wasn't long at all. It's only about a month or two before I was discharged. And then I... I um, continue doing it to, to, uh, till after the after the war. Continued. Yes. Working as an electrician. Yes. Uh, then I uh, I started my own business, having been in business before the war. I knew the ropes, and I started in an area called Sea Point which is a town close to the city of, of, of Cape Town. And I stayed there until I retired. And did you meet your wife there? Or had you I known met her my wife during the war. Um, I, she lived in a country which was called Rhodesia. Today it's called Zimbabwe. And um, she was in Cape Town on vacation with her family, and I had leave to go to to my family. My mother and two sisters were still alive in Cape Town, and uh, I met met her at a dance in Cape Town. In Cape Town, and this was. Uh, at the end of 1940, and we got married in uh, October 41. And I was sh shipped overseas in December 41. When you returned and you set up your own business, did you join any types of veterans' organizations? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Were uh, you active in those organizations? Very definitely. In fact, uh, it got to a stage where we had a big group of not only electricians, it was any as long as you were in the forces, army, navy, tanks, air force, you could all join. And uh, it was an organization which was formed in after World War I. It was called the Moths. It, and the word Moths stood for Memorable Order of Tin Hats. And 
our group after being allowed to meet once a month in this hotel and another hotel, we all put in, I forget how much, and built our, uh, we were granted a piece of land uh, for one dollar a year for 99 years. And um, we built a clubhouse and two bowling greens. It became, uh, the name was Crusader Bowling Club and they, the two greens and grass bowls was the game played mainly there. How do you feel serving in the military affected your life? I think greatly. It educated me in quite a, a big way. To see the big world, different countries, uh, how people acted, how reacted, even in the units reacting to different people, different backgrounds. It was an education and uh, something I wouldn't have missed for, for anything. I definitely I gave up something like five years of my time, but it was well worth it. And as we complete this interview, is there um, anything, a thought or an incident that you'd like to share with us and with your family who will also be viewing this tape? Or is there anything, any additional comments that you would like to make as we complete this? Well, visiting Israel was a big thing because my late father had relatives on his side who were living in Israel. I had the names, found some addresses, and I was able to visit some of these people, young and old. And uh, I was also able to meet up with uh, my mother's relations in, in England. Uh, that, that was uh, after the war, not during the war. I, I wasn't based in England at all during the war. So your, your experiences also, as you said, let you see parts of the world or even go back to parts of the world that perhaps you might not have done That's had correct. you done it in the war? No, uh, I, I doubt if I'd have, well, I wouldn't have gone across North Africa and Egypt and spent all that time there and, and met up with American soldiers and met in, uh, actually in Cairo they had a club called the South African Club. Well, I suppose the South Africans like to, to meet there and there was the, the, um, Dutch-speaking section of South Africans who Dutch was their family language and I was fluent in both and um, that was also uh, an education, an opportunity to meet up with the other section of the country. Um, there was a small amount of apartheid in, in, the, in the military, but uh, when it came down to tin tacks, ex we accepted everyone. That was the, it, the military uh, style. When you mentioned meeting up with some of the American soldiers, were they always cordial and friendly to you? Oh, yes. <laughs> All they, they want to know is what is what is the country like in South Africa? And they had full of questions for South Africa, the same as I had questions for America. And having moved to America in these past uh, few decades, are you happy to be here? Do you miss your home country? Oh, no, not at all. I've become an American citizen uh, a, a little over a year ago. 
I so well remember the day I arrived in America, went through immigration <coughs> in uh, in um, oh my. Um, Was it in New York? No, no, uh, here in, in Boston. In Boston, mm -hmm. And um, at the airport I carried on me, which I had to hand in to immigration certificates from South Africa, health, um, education, um, military experience, financial, uh, whether I was um, my marital status, um, a birth certificate, my late wife's uh, a death certificate, and I, there was only one big envelope. I handed it to the immigration officer, and um, this is at the at the airport, and. He went through all the documents and uh, gave me my green card, which stated that I am a legal alien and I had my uh, social security number on the card and a big smile, a firm handshake. Welcome to the USA. <laughs> And good luck. Well, <coughs> I like that. Felt as if my luck had already started. Well, Mr. Wolf, we want to thank you today too. You've told us a fascinating story, one that's a bit different from the other stories we've heard because it comes from another area of the that's world. Right. I want that's to thank right. you for coming in today. My great pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure.